I should like to call your attention this morning to the story concerning Nicodemus, the account of which you remember is to be found in the Gospel according to St. John in the third chapter. Let me read the first eight verses. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, Ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. Now, most of you will recall that we began considering this incident, this story, this particular case of Nicodemus last Sunday morning. And I would remind you that we are approaching it from a particular angle, and this is the angle. We are concerned about uh, the condition of all those who are seeking that fullness which is to be found in our blessed Lord and Savior. We start with that great statement in the 16th verse of the first chapter of this gospel. Of his fullness of all we received, and grace upon grace. That is Christianity. That is the Christian life. Receiving of his fullness. And what we are doing is to discover how this fullness is to be received. And in order to do that, of course, we have to consider some of the mistakes and errors which others before us and we ourselves in our time make and have made in this endeavor to receive of this fullness. Now, that's the way in which we are approaching the case of Nicodemus. He obviously is a, an example of this very thing. He listens to our Lord, he watches him working his miracles. And he immediately begins to feel that here is one who has something that he lacks. And therefore he seeks this interview with him by night. Now last Sunday morning, you remember, we looked at the character of Nicodemus in general. Saw his virtues and excellences, but also saw that there was a central radical defect and weakness. In other words, there was an error in his whole approach. And that is the thing about which we are concerned now. Now, I, I tried to describe that uh, error, that uh, false thing in the whole approach with which our Lord immediately dealt by even interrupting Nicodemus before he was allowed uh, to finish his statement. And I suggested that uh, they could be described in this way, that uh, Nicodemus was still in charge of himself. And that is always fatal. As long as we feel that we can handle this matter, and as long as we try to handle it, we shall not succeed. We shall be interrupted and in a sense almost rebuffed. He'll break in upon us as he did with Nicodemus. And he will say to us, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born again, cannot see the kingdom of God. You've got to give up all that. You need a new start. In other words, uh, we can put it, if you like, like this, by saying that he approached our Lord as a teacher and not as a savior. He felt, if you like, that he needed something that could be added on to what he already possessed. And uh, he regarded it as something which he could understand. That's the thing that keeps on recurring here. And even after... Uh, the point at which I left off reading, Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? He's still trying uh, to understand. Well, now then, there are these points put in a very general form. 
But now we must work them out a little more in detail and apply them, because this really is a most important matter. Uh, There are lessons, it seems to me, to be learned here from Nicodemus, which apply in a very special way to a certain kind of person who is religious, as he was, and who really is concerned for something bigger, something deeper, something more vital. Very well, then, let me try to put the lessons in a more spiritual form. We were merely looking at him in general before. So I would lay it down as a principle that one of the things we are taught here is to beware of the danger, if I may so put it, of trying to go on before we've started. Now, I I don't uh, put it like that in order to be paradoxical. Uh, I literally mean what I say. Nicodemus was a man who was trying to go on before he'd started. Now, here is a point at which the devil very frequently misleads this particular type of person. What type of person? Well, the type of person who's been brought up in a religious atmosphere. That's the extraordinary thing, as we've all discovered from personal experience and in dealing with others and in meeting with others and discussing these things with others, we all must have discovered this that though we all eventually come to the same place, the same point, we come there in very different ways. And people have varying difficulties and problems. For instance, the case of the man who's uh, perhaps never been to a place of worship in his life, was not brought up in a Christian home, never went to a Christian church, never went to Sunday school and so on, lived a purely worldly, materialistic life, who suddenly, in some mysterious manner, is apprehended and arrested and becomes a Christian. Now, there is one type of case, but there's another case of one who is brought up, as I say, who has been brought up in the Christian home from childhood. Who's been hearing about these things? The Bible, gone to services, gone to Sunday school, and so on. As this whole religious background, Well, patently, these two men are going to face different kinds of problems and difficulties. And they are confronted by different kinds of pitfalls. And the devil in his subtlety, knowing all about us and all about our background, knows exactly the kind of trap to set for each and every one of us. Now, here I say we are looking at a man who is typical of the religious kind of person. One who's been brought up in all this, and always brought up in this. Now, these are people who, perhaps uh, meeting someone else, or reading a biography, or uh, reading something of the history of the church throughout the centuries, come across a, a type and an order of Christian living, which they recognize at once is quite beyond anything that they've ever known and experienced. And being religious people with this background, they're anxious to be like that and to discover how that is to be obtained. And immediately they set out to seek this. Now there are large numbers of such people. And very often they can spend a whole lifetime in seeking and inquiring and following various leads taking up certain interests, reading in a certain direction, attending certain types of meetings. Their motive is exactly the same as that of Nicodemus, and it is an excellent motive. They recognize something different, something higher, something better. And they're very anxious to obtain this, but they never seem to obtain it. I say you can spend a lifetime in that condition, always seeking, never finding. What's the trouble with these people? Well, the first thing I'm suggesting about them is the thing that uh, surely is thought so plainly in this record concerning Nicodemus. It is the danger of assuming the vital thing instead of making quite certain and sure that we have it. That's obviously the main trouble with Nicodemus. He acts on an assumption. 
His whole approach suggests that. As I was putting it in general last Sunday morning, if I may put it quite simply and plainly, this is really the danger of assuming that we are Christians when we are not Christians. Well, if we don't recognize that such a thing is possible, well, obviously we are in this condition. And many of us have known what it is to be in this condition. You assume that you're a Christian. You assume it for the reasons that I've given. You say, I've always been a Christian. Never was anything else. Was brought up to be a Christian. So the assumption is that we are Christian. And then all we need is, of course, is some addition or some modification or some extension of that which we already have. But that is one of the most fatal errors of which one can ever be guilty. Let me put it in a little more theological way by putting it like this. It is the danger of seeking sanctification before we have justification. There is no greater danger, it seems to me, to the religious kind of person than just this very thing. And oh, how often can one illustrate this in the long history and story of the Christian church. You go in for sanctification without ever having been justified. Or, let me put it in another way, and still more relevant to this case, it is the danger of seeking sanctification before we know anything at all about regeneration. Now, if we can put it still more simply by putting it like this, it is the mistake of trying to grow before you've been born. It sounds ridiculous, yet that's the very thing that so many are trying to do. They're trying to develop, they're trying to grow and to increase, but they haven't any life. That's the obvious trouble with Nicodemus. He comes, he says, there, Master, though we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. And obviously he was going on. He was going to say, well, now, what is this? Something extra. What I want this. What do what you tell me to do? He's interrupted. I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot even see the kingdom of God leave alone and enter into it. You can't begin to grow and to discover what is necessary to stimulate growth and development and increase unless you first of all planted the seed of life unless you've got the seed of life in you. Now, this, this, I say, is a very common error. And it is, obviously, a very basic and fundamental error. If you like it put in another way, we can say that it is the danger of having a concern about the application of Christian truth before there is any Christian life. It is putting the application of the truth before there is definite evidence of life itself. Now, there are many, many uh, tendencies that uh, tend uh, to encourage us to fall into this particular error. And I suppose if we were to single out one more than any other as being particular, particularly dangerous, it is the whole teaching which goes under the heading of mysticism. Mysticism. It's, uh, to many people, and especially to this religious type, a very attractive kind of teaching. You uh, read of men, monks, hermits, anchorites, men in the past who were anxious to get to a knowledge of God, who would become very dissatisfied with their lives and discontented with things as they were in themselves and in the church, and who felt that they must go out for this, knowledge of God. And they felt that the way to do that was to separate themselves from the world, to undergo a very rigorous kind of life and existence, fasting, praying, sometimes wearing camel hair shirts and so on, all with the, with the object of uh, mortifying the flesh and encouraging the development of the spiritual life and understanding. And as you know, as the centuries passed, the teaching of these people became very systematized. And they drew up their manuals of the devout life, and books of instruction, 
as to what one is to do. There are many such books available always on the market, The Practice of the Presence of God, and various other books by mystics and about mystics, all of them designed to deal with the culture and the nurture of the spiritual life. Now, these uh, have a great fascination for the religious type of person. They seem to show us what we've got to do in order that we may ultimately come to that knowledge of God. This summum bonum, the vision of God, the knowledge of God. You have to go through various processes, dark night of the soul, negation and so on, and at last you come to the point of illumination. Now, there have probably been thousands, not to say more, Christian people, at least people brought up in the bosom of the Christian church, who, because they take these things seriously, conscientious, intellectual kind of person generally, have this feeling of dissatisfaction, and here they confront this teaching, and they begin to take it up and to study it and to try and put it into practice, and they try to press on and on in this. But they never seem to find any satisfaction at all. And what is the trouble? Well, I'm suggesting that the whole trouble is the very thing that comes out in this story. They're seeking sanctification, but they know nothing about justification. They're assuming that they're in the right relationship to God. They're trying to develop their Christian life. The question is, have they got any Christian life at all? Now, here, you see, is obviously something that uh, demands our closest attention. Let me give you some examples to illustrate what I mean. Wasn't this the whole trouble with Martin Luther? before that great crisis took place in his life, it, he was assuming that he was in a relationship to God, which was a right one, but he was dissatisfied, hence he becomes a monk and does all that he did. But he came to this critical understanding that his whole process was wrong and that the teaching which he'd been given was all wrong. Suddenly his eyes are open to this great preliminary truth. The just shall live by faith. And there's no starting in the Christian life until and unless you come to that point. His great problem was that of justification. He thought it was sanctification. He was concentrating on the road to sanctification. It was all wrong. He's only put right and he can only begin to grow and develop and become sanctified as he understands this great teaching concerning justification. Now, you see, the particular reason in his case was this. Brought up as he had been as a Roman Catholic, he believed that his baptism had given him new life, that it had regenerated him, and so on. So, it's inevitable that he assumes that he's got the fundamental thing. He came to see that he hadn't. He was a bit muddled even after that about the relationship of these two. But still, this is the trouble with that whole kind of teaching. It does tend to base our justification upon our sanctification instead of putting them the other way around. Well, there's one notable example, but there are others. People like Whitfield, George Whitfield and the Brothers Wesley and all the members of the Holy Club in Oxford were doing exactly the same thing. Here were men, particularly the Wesley Brothers, brought up in an unusually religious atmosphere where well, these things were taken very seriously. And they were dissatisfied, so they met together as a body of students and graduates in Oxford, and their concern was to develop the holy life. And they went in for the same things, fasting, visiting prisoners, self-mortifications, giving up their posts, going out to preach to the pagans in Georgia, and all the rest of it. What are they trying to do? Oh, they're trying to promote their sanctification. They're trying to get this extra something. They're like Nicodemus. They say, we are religious people, but we, uh, there's something more, there's something better. And they were searching and seeking after that. But there again, as in the case of Luther, you remember, they came to the sudden realization that they hadn't got a foundation, that their whole endeavor had been wrong. Whitfield undoubtedly was so rigorous in his practice of these things that he ruined his health 
once and forever through too much fasting and so on. Now, the difficulty was that they were assuming that they were in this life, but they were not. And they were brought to see that. And from the moment they saw that, and the centrality and the primary position of the doctrine of justification, they were put right. But not until then. They might have gone on spending the rest of their lives like that, like thousands are doing today. The so-called religious as distinct from the laity, and the whole body of teaching encourages one to go astray because it assumes the vital thing, even as Nicodemus was assuming the vital thing. Well, I could give you many other examples. I remember one personal one, if you'll forgive it. I remember being out in Toronto in Canada preaching in 1932, and uh, the first Sunday, uh, having been welcomed by the minister, I felt I should uh, inform the congregation, which was strange to me and I strange to them, that it was my custom to divide my ministry roughly into two halves, that on Sunday mornings I preached, uh, as it were, to the saints, acting on the assumption that I was preaching to Christian people who needed to be built up and established in the faith, but that on Sunday evening I preached with a general assumption that I was preaching to unbelievers, preaching evangelistically and for conversion. I remember at the end of the service, I was standing at the door with the minister, meeting people as they were going out. And a lady, a very prominent uh, old lady, a member of that church, astounded the minister, who knew her so well and regarded her as one of the pillars of the cause, by saying to me, she said, um, I'm going to come again this evening. She never went to the evening service. She only went to the morning service, as such people so often do. Uh, she said, uh, to the astonishment of the minister, I'm coming to the evening service, and he was amazed. She said, oh, no, she said, having listened to you this morning, she said, I come to the conclusion that I need the evening service. Well, that's right. There was something evidently in the morning service that made her query as to whether she was one of these people who needed to be built up, or whether she was really somebody who needed to be born again. And oftentimes I've been told the same thing. I was told it by a member of this church only last Sunday night. I've often been told this. People have come to me and said, you know, when I first came here, I came assuming that I was a Christian. I'd always thought of myself as a Christian. The first thing I discovered here was that I'd never been a Christian at all. And at first, they, some of them admitted they resented it and disliked this very much. They came under a kind of condemnation and they resented it. But then they came to the point when they saw it was true and they thanked God for it. And later, they have their experience of regeneration and truly become Christian. This then is a very real danger. You assume you're a Christian, then all you need is to be built up and to be added unto. But there's nothing there. You can't go on until you've started. You can't grow unless you're born. What a fatal error that is. But let's go on and put it in other ways. It is this whole danger of thinking of Christianity in terms of ideas. Ideas which we are to apply rather than in terms of life. That is really the cardinal error. And how common this is. The whole thing is thought of in terms of ideas, points of view, notions. And it is our business then to get hold of these and to uh, understand them and grasp them and then proceed to put them into operation. I don't want to be misunderstood in what I'm about to say, but I feel constrained to put it like this. There are far too many of us, I think, who are prone to think of this whole matter in terms of ideas. Now, this was brought home very forcibly to me only last week by a man to whom I was talking, who has just become interested in these matters at all. He'd come from a purely non-religious background. He'd never been taken to a place of worship as a child, but now, as a student, he's met others 
and he's become interested in these things. And he made to me a most interesting and significant remark. He told me that while he was away recently on vacation, he'd not been attending a, a place of worship too regularly. I said, why not? Well, he said, you know, there is a limit to the amount that one can take in. And thereby he betrayed to me his whole position. You see, the attitude is this. Now, here is a subject. Here are a number of teachings and of ideas. And, of course, you come to that and then you listen and you make your notes and you're exactly like a student taking up any other subject. And the student, at first, of course, of course finds it very difficult. He's entering upon the study of a new subject. Never touched it before. Doesn't know anything about it. And there is, of course, a limit to what one can take in. That's quite all right. You get tired, you get brain fatigue and so on, and so you can only take it in a certain amount, and you have to try to ration this in order that you may go on and develop. But I maintain that that is not true when you come to this particular realm. And that is where the fallacy comes in. It is the fallacy, you see, of assuming that we've got to do this. It's our grasping ideas and then masticating them as it were. They become a part of us and then we proceed to put them into practice. Of course Christianity does involve a teaching, but not in that way. There is something other here. There is something extra. There is something that the world knows nothing about. The Holy Spirit and his action and his operation. So that as I've often put to such people, I've often said to them, look here, you attend as regularly as you can. But they say, I, I find I can't take it in. I say, don't you worry about that. Because experience has taught me this, and it's one of the most wonderful things about preaching and about the whole pastoral office. Constantly one is being told that some side-glancing remark has been the very thing that the Spirit has used to bring such and such a person to a knowledge of the truth. The minister rightly prepares his sermon. He has order, he has logic, he has development. And his danger, the danger, of course, is to think that it is that that's going to do the work. No, it isn't. That's merely the scaffolding. The spirit uh, does the work. And one is therefore often humbled and corrected by finding that something that one merely said as an aside is the very thing that's used of God. In other words, we are not left to ourselves. This isn't the subject. This isn't a matter of ideas. It is this other uh, element, this other spiritual element that really matters above everything else. I don't know. Sometimes I'm almost tempted to criticize those of you who take notes in this service. I mean just this. It's right, I know, in a sense, to take notes. It helps you to think these things over and to work them out. But let me give you a warning. Be careful, lest while you are taking notes, you are missing something of the Spirit himself. And he's all together. Well, I don't know that you should say amen to that. That was a bit of self-righteousness, I think, whoever said it. It was a self-righteous remark. But I'm just emphasizing that the spirit is more important than the knowledge here. And that is where this realm is altogether different from other, every other realm. Let's put it like this then. The danger for the religious person is to go in for a study and a knowledge of the Bible. And it's possible, my friends, to have a knowledge of the Bible which is really expert. And yet, you've never known its meaning. You've never seen its teaching. There are people who have an almost perfect knowledge of the letter of the Scripture, but have never known the message of the Scripture. You can attend Bible schools and classes. You can attend colleges. And you will get this knowledge and information which is purely intellectual. And in the meantime, you may know nothing about the message at all. You may have missed the spirit and the meaning completely. This is a very terrible danger. This notion which obviously Nicodemus had, some extra idea, some additional knowledge. It is the danger of this purely intellectual approach which forgets the heart, the whole man, the emotional feeling element. Now, there it is then put in another form. Or let me put it like this. And this is equally true. And this has been true of large numbers of people. 
It is the danger of putting a decision in the place of regeneration. What do I mean? Well, what I mean is this. You can decide to go in for religion. You can decide to go in for what you regard as Christianity. You listen to a sermon, you read a book or something like that, or you talk to people, and uh, they put the truth before you, and you are convinced about this thing intellectually, and you decide to go in for it. And you change your way of life, and you join this society of people who are interested in this thing, and you become one of them. Now, that's something that not only can be done, but which large numbers of people do. They not only do it in evangelistic campaigns, they do it in ordinary church services, and they do it, as I say, in private conversation. They take up religion. They think they're taking up Christianity. Now, why am I querying this? Well, I'm querying it for this reason. That I am asserting that it is possible for us to do that while remaining unregenerate. It is entirely our action. There has been no vital operation in the soul. There is no seed of new life placed in such a person. On what grounds do I make this statement? Well, I make it on this ground, on these grounds. That uh, throughout the years one observes what happens, and I've been in meetings which have been very deeply concerned about this thing. I've been interested in organizations which have had to inquire into a phenomenon like this. An organization working amongst a certain class of person, and they get large numbers of decisions. And here are people who appear to be converted and have become truly Christian. And they're active and zealous in the cause. But then, these people have to go to a different kind of life. They go out of that atmosphere where they've been, and they go out into the world, and do work with various kinds of people. And they not only cease to practice what they've been doing before, they deny everything that they believe. They pour scorn and ridicule upon it. They not only drop it, I say, but they become antagonistic to it. Now, this is a fact, a phenomenon. It is called the leakage, the leakage that takes place in Christian unions. And the statistics with regard to evangelistic campaigns show exactly the same thing. A given number of professions examine the position in a year, in five years, and you'll find an amazing story. There are evangelists who say that they don't expect more than 10% of their converts to stand. Now, what's all that? Well, here I say our eyes are made to concentrate upon a very great and a very real possibility. You can have a temporary persuasion. You can have a kind of intellectual conviction. Or if a number of people are going in for this, well, you do the same thing. Now, people take up cults in exactly the same way. Many of the cults that are around and about us today can give the same sort of statistics of converts. People who join them, you are familiar with many of them. They come round your houses selling their books and so on. And they can give you facts and figures. They can tell you of the additions that are taking place. People who say that they've suddenly been taken hold of by this and they've seen it and they go in for it and are most zealous and active. You can do something like that in the realm of the Christian church. You can say that you believe these things and you can become a great church worker. But it doesn't of necessity prove that you really are truly Christian. You can be in the position of a man like Nicodemus, who thinks that he can decide to take up this and add this on to what he's got, and so on. And there are many, it seems to me, who are relying simply upon a decision that they once took. They took a decision. And they feel that that has somehow put them right. All I'm concerned to say is that you can take a decision without being regenerate. And if you're not regenerate, you are not a Christian. Well, here it is, it seems to me, on the very surface of this incident and this story. It's a, a very real thing and a very dangerous thing. 
It's a point, of course, that the Protestant reformers and the Puritans after them were very concerned about. They talked about false professors. They were very fond of preaching on the parable of the ten virgins, for we must never forget that the five foolish virgins were as satisfied that they were right as were the five wise ones. They were astonished and amazed. And our Lord himself teaches us that there are people who at the final day of judgment who are going to have a great shock. They are the people who will say, Lord, Lord, have we not done this, that, and the other? He will say, I never knew you. Depart from me. There is nothing more dangerous than to attempt to proceed in the Christian life without being absolutely certain that you have the life within you. Very well, then that brings me to my last point this morning, which I'll put in this form. It all really can be summed up in this way by saying that it is the failure to realize that this is a gift of a new and a divine kind of life. It is altogether different. And it is the failure to see that that accounts for so much of the trouble. Now, our Lord puts it here in this great statement in verse 6. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. They're as different as that. We must get rid of all the ideas with which we've started. We must shed all these natural ideas. It's not something you go in for. It's not something that you understand and get hold of its principles and then proceed to apply them. You see, that's, that's one of the great troubles, isn't it? That was the trouble with an ancient heresy which goes by the name of Pelagianism. I remember how during the last war, the then Archbishop of Canterbury, Dr. William Temple, in dealing with the case of the pacifists, said that the trouble with the pacifists was that they were guilty of the heresy of Pelagianism. What's that? Well, it's this. It is to expect Christian conduct from people who are not Christians. And that's a very common thing today. People seem to regard Christianity as a body of teaching which others can apply and that a man becomes a Christian by recognizing the truth of these principles and then trying to proceed to put them into practice and to persuade others to join him in doing so. So that you try to get the state to apply Christian principles. But the state isn't Christian. To try and get members of the state to act in a Christian way. But they can't act in a Christian way unless they're first and foremost Christians. No man can live the Sermon on the Mount as he is. It's impossible. It was surely preached in order to show that. No, no, before you can live the Christian life, you must be a Christian. And not to recognize that, I say, is to fall into that ancient heresy of Pelagianism. Well, very well, what is this? Well, as our Lord makes plain and clear here to Nicodemus, the glory of this is this, that it's something that happens to us. It isn't something we do, it is something that is done to us. The wind bloweth where it listeth. Thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh, nor whither it goeth. So, so is every one that is born of the Spirit. You can't, can't give birth to yourself. This is something that happens to you. It's a new creation. It's comparable to the original creation, something being made out of nothing, something being produced, not by men, God, born again, born from above, born of the Spirit, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit. He cannot enter into the kingdom of God. So, you see, it's taken right out of our hands. You can't decide to be born again. There are people who give that impression. They say, you decide for Christ and you'll be born again. That's putting it the wrong way around. It's impossible. If you could decide for Christ, you don't need to be born again. But we are told the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. The princes of this world didn't recognize him. The only man who can believe in Christ is the man to whom these things have been revealed by the Spirit, the Spirit that searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. 
You must be born again. You can't even decide that. Because if you could, as I say, it would indicate spiritual understanding. But here's a man who hasn't got any at all. The fact that he's told that he must be born again means he's got to be made from the very beginning, from the foundation. There's nothing to build on. It's an entire new creation. Now there's the fundamental thing. And of course because of that it is something very mysterious. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. Don't marvel at this, don't be surprised at this. You ought to see this. I'm not talking about the flesh. Nicodemus thought he was. It makes his clever debating point. How can a man be born when he's old? He's thinking in fleshly terms. That's the mistake. That's not, this is not flesh. This is spirit. It's a different realm. Don't marvel at this. And our Lord then goes on to use that uh, extraordinary comparison. The wind bloweth where it listeth. You hear the sound. You can't tell whence it cometh, nor whither it goeth. There's a mystery about it. You see the effects and results, but you don't understand. Oh, the one who is born of the Spirit is like that. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. My dear friends, you're outside the realm of understanding. You're above it, beyond it. It's not irrational. It's supra-rational. This is divine. This is the realm, as Pascal came to see, that is beyond the limits of reason. The supreme achievement of reason, he said, is to bring us to see that there is a limit to reason. And here we've reached the limit and we are beyond it. The realm of the mysterious, the supernatural, the divine, God acting. And man doesn't try to understand here. He just stands in amazement and astonishment. He realizes that it were utter folly for him to try to understand at all that that would be an assertion still of something in himself. No, no, he can't and he doesn't attempt to. We are outside the realm of intellect and thank God we are. Can't you see that if this were not true that Christianity would be the prerogative of certain special people? It would be the special prerogative of intellectual, able people. You see, if it's all a matter of ideas and understanding ideas and being able to take in philosophic concepts and then trying to persuade others, well, of course, the man who's got ability, he has a great advantage over everybody else. But that's not Christianity. There is as much hope here for the unintelligent as for the intelligent. There is an equal hope for all. That's the glory of the Christian faith. It includes all classes, all types, and all kinds. Why? Well, because it is the action of God, not the action of man. He doesn't presuppose anything in us, except that we are lost and helpless and hopeless. It is all his action, like the way the Spirit operates. So you're not just taking ideas and making notes of them, and then grasping them and putting them into practice. Not at all, but something possesses you. And you are aware of the fact that God has been dealing with your soul and that you're a new man. Very well, I leave it at that for this morning. All you and I can realize is this, that there is something which got it if we are not truly Christian. We realize our need of something. And there's only one thing we can do, and that is, as Nicodemus did, to go to him and just wait and listen. You must go to him, as I said last Sunday morning. But you can't do any more than that. You'll find even that your motive for going was wrong, that your whole approach was wrong. Don't worry about that. He'll put that right. He does that. That's all we can do at that point, is to have the feeling within us that there's something there. We don't understand it. We don't know what it is. But we don't want to argue any longer. We don't want to be clever. We're just aware of bankruptcy and of need. And we listen. We wait. And the next thing, the next thing is this. You know it's happened to you. You know it's happened. How do we know it's happened? Well, obviously, that has to wait till next Sunday. But I hope to go on with that next Sunday. 
When it happens, you know it's happened. And when it's happened, you can begin to grow. Being justified by faith, you can begin to consider development, sanctification, advance, growth in grace, and in the knowledge of the Lord. But if you try, as I, to vary my picture, if you try to build your building without a foundation, it'll collapse. It'll be nothing. You can't grow until you're born. You can't proceed on the journey until you've started. And so, there comes this great word to us, and it comes in the form of a question. Have we been born again? Have we received the life of God in our souls? It's no use proceeding a step further until you are certain and sure of the answer to that great preliminary question. For if you try to go, he'll stop you, and he'll say to you, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see, leave alone enter, the kingdom of God. Now let us sing as our closing hymn, hymn number 173, part 1. 173, part 1. Jesus, the very thought of thee with sweetness fills the breast. This is the hymn of those who know him. 173, part 1.
keep us from falling and to present us faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. And may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship and the communion of the Holy Spirit abide and continue with us now throughout the remainder of this our short, uncertain, earthly life and pilgrimage and until we shall see him as he is and be made like unto him in the glory everlasting. Amen. We do hope that you've been helped by the preaching of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. All of the sermons contained within the MLJ Trust audio library are now available for free download. You may share the sermons or broadcast them. However, because of international copyright, please be advised that we are asking first that these sermons never be offered for sale by a third party. And second, that these sermons will not be edited in any way for length or to use as audio clips. You can find our contact information on our website at mljtrust.org. That's mljtrust.org.